I'm looking at Dora's and I'm, I'm making some inferences from that. And then I'm saying out in the wild, we're not really seeing that. Yeah. So if the biggest thing for me is it obfuscates the reality of, of what's actually happening with incidents. We just have this really seemingly clean, tidy number. Our MTTR went up and it went down. And then the question I always ask people is, well, if it went up, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, well, I guess we got to go figure out why. Well, how are you going to figure out why? Well, I guess we got to go look at all those incidents. And then I ask people, well, what if it went down? Wouldn't you want to know why? Like if, why you're getting better or why things are getting better? I only want to research it if things are bad. Otherwise, no. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Dev Interrupted. My name is Dan Lines, and I'm here with Courtney Nash, who has one of the coolest, possibly made up titles, but possibly real. Internet Incident Librarian. Yep. That's is that right. right. Yep. You got it. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. I love that that title. Still possibly made up, possibly Still real. Still possibly we'll just, made up. We'll just leave that one out there for yeah. the listeners to decide. Let everyone decide. What yep. could that possibly mean? We have a, I think, a, maybe a spicy show, <laughs> a spicy topic. It's the hot topic show. Hot topic, especially since we're at DevOps Enterprise Summit, where we hear a lot about the Dora metrics, one of them being MTTR. Yes. And you might have a hot take on that. The end of MTTR or how would you describe it? Yeah, I feel a little like the fox in the hen house yeah. here, but Gene accepted the talk. So, you know, there's that. So it's on him. Uh, yeah, it's all Gene's <laughs> fault. Uh, so I have been interested in complex systems for a long time. I used to study the brain and I got sucked down an internet rabbit hole quite a long, quite a while ago. And I've, I have in, I've had beliefs for a long time that I haven't had data to back up necessarily. And we see these sort of perverted behaviors, not that kind of perverted, but where we take metrics in the industry and then Goddard's law, pick whatever you pick, people incentivize them and then weird sure. things happen. But I think we spend too little time looking at the humans in the system and a lot of time focusing on the technical aspects and the data that come out of the technical side of systems. So I started a project about a year ago called The Void. It's the Verica Open Incident Database. Actually real, not made up name. And <laughs> it is, it's the largest now collection of public incident reports. So if you all have an outage and you hopefully go and figure out and talk about what happened and then you write that up, well, that's out in the world. So I'm not writing these. I'm, I'm curating them. I'm collecting, You're collecting. them. Yep. I'm a librarian. Yes. So I have about 10,000 of them now and a bunch of metadata associated with all these incident reports. So these all different companies yeah. or sizes or every like size you can imagine yeah. um, from probably there's one or two, like one or two person startups or a project that someone's maintaining even sometimes all the way up to massive multinational conglomerate corporations, about six over 600 organizations in the void. And usually when I hear about like a publicly available incident, it's usually like a security breach. I guess I would ask like, where are you getting the, like, how do you get these? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I would love for people to send them to me Submit. more. Okay. And I, there's a very inefficient way of doing that right now that I'm hoping to improve upon. But most of this was, there were some initial databases, if you will, or small efforts at this. Dan Liu had a GitHub repo called Kubernetes AF that had a bunch of, that's where I started because I was doing Kubernetes okay. research for Verica. And then some other folks I knew had actually kept all of the SRE weekly incidents and like co collecting those and hanging on to them. So some people just sent those to me. And then a lot of it is just going out and collecting them online, like literally because web scraping, because that's yeah. fun. Everybody likes doing web scraping. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's easy and it works so well. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So Highly it's, reliable. Yes. And, yeah. and I've even hand entered a whole bunch. As I, I, sure. I'm in a couple of different slacks where these things pop up. And so if I see it, I'll add it in. So I've yeah. touched a lot of the ones that are in there. So you have a collection. You have a library of incidents. Yes. 600 organizations uh, yep. about all different sizes. About 15 years yeah. worth, I'd 15 say. 15 years. Okay, over Go, a 15 year Going period. back to about 2008. Yeah, yep. seems forever ago. 2008. Yeah, yeah there, are, there were nice. some weird old like NASA things in there that like, they might still be in there, but I yeah. don't really, it doesn't really count. And what are you, okay, so now that you have this, what are you doing with it? So we have a bunch of metadata. So we know which organization it was. Most of the time we know what day it happened on, what day it got written up. 
if they tell you it was DNS, because it's always DNS, you know, we tag a lot of the metadata for that. So we have things like the duration of the incident, if that's stated or if you can calculate it from a status page, for example, that has its own stop and start time sure. listed on it. We pick out whether they talk about what kind of an incident it is. Was it a the common ones you see are like degraded performance, partial outage, full production outage, increased errors, very popular. So there's a few security things in there, but it, the goal, there's a lot of security breach databases out there. We don't, nobody needs more of that. Somebody probably does, but not us. Yeah. Um, and these are what we think more of as like availability incidents, right? Yeah, yeah. So when AWS falls over, half of the, everything falls yeah, over. Yeah, stuff's right? not working. Stuff's not working. <laughs> it may or may not be completely not working. And so there's a little bit of security stuff in there that's mostly like DDoS stuff. Yeah. So we've got all these metadata. And what I wanted to start looking at was, first of all, what you do when you get data like this is you just swim in it for a while. So that's what I was doing last year is I was just looking at them. Like you're sort of just charting the data in different ways and looking, what do these even look like? Which it turns out a lot of people don't really do with their incident data if they have them. When I ask a lot of people, I'm like, have you ever, you know, just looked at like the distribution of your duration data? And they're like, no, why would I do that? And I'm like, because it's not normal. Not that you're not normal, you're <laughs> weird, we're all weird, but, but what we think of, what we often think of in terms of distributions, what we're used to seeing in most, a lot of our lives, right, because we're not like PhD statistician people, is the normal bell curve. Sure. That's where your mean comes from. That's not what our incident data look like. So incident duration data are heavily skewed. And they're heavily skewed towards the, when, if you're looking at your graph, they're heavily skewed towards the left side of your y-axis, okay? So that means that you're, you've got, you're binning your incidents, okay? So you're taking everything and you're saying, these are one hour, one to two hours, two to three hours, what have you. And then you count up how many you have in each yeah. of those bins, right? That's a histogram. We love histograms. Yep. So they're incredibly skewed, which is actually a good thing because it means if you believe duration data, which we could get into that. Yeah, the <laughs> so, accuracy of that. Yeah, but let's the, the say, fidelity yeah, of those data. But yeah. let's just say, hit it with a magic wand, we can yeah, believe them. let's say it's good. We're all actually pretty good at resolving things pretty fast. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Like, mo the majority of the incidents that we have duration data for in the void are resolved in under two hours. Yay. <laughs> like, y'all are doing a good job of that. So that means that you see a big stack up, taller bars on the left-hand side, and then a big, long tail. Sure. So that's what we call a skewed distribution, not a normal distribution. And so the stats 101 version of that is if you don't have a normal distribution, you can't use the mean because it's unreliable because of the variability, the variance in those data. So the yeah. outliers will influence that mean. And you could some people say, well, use the median. And I know that that's what they use internally with Dora at Google. I have some simulations that show that's still problematic. So I went I've showed some of these data in my talk yesterday and yeah. it, the numbers are all over the place. It also begs the question of over what time frame do you collect those data? And what's the sample size of those data? Because all of those things impact things like averages and significance of things and whatnot. So like if you're Cloudflare, you've got a lot of incidents. Yeah. Like 3,458, I think if I'm not wrong <laughs> of what's in <laughs> the void right now over a long period of time because they report on everything. Yeah. Okay. okay. So they report on a, a five minute performance degradation in Rio de Janeiro, but you don't want more incidents, right? You don't want, you don't want to have more, but that's the only way you really can get any of that kind of fidelity out of it. And so the means are all over the place and they get weirder, the smaller your window is, right? Gotcha. So if you're yep. like, oh, our MTTR last month was, I'm like, you can't trust that. And so the coolest thing I saw last year when I was starting to build up some of my hypotheses around this was an engineer at Google, Stepan Davidovich, did this really neat study. So he has access to a bunch of internal Google incident data that the rest of us don't have. Okay. And then he went and scraped a bunch of status pages also from some companies he didn't name. And same thing, data look exactly like what we have in the void, this left, you know, skewed distribution. So then he ran a bunch of Monte Carlo simulations with those. And I don't know if people are familiar with Monte Carlo simulations, but it's like an A-B test, right? But instead of A-B testing, like, this web page versus that web page of your website data coming in, you've got a population of data and you just split it up. It's, you got a hypothesis, you got an experiment, you do a treatment to one of them and then you see what you get. Yeah. So he took the duration data for one year. He did a couple other things that we don't have to get into right now necessarily, but, and then he split those populations up and for half of them, he made them faster. So he, he made like the response quicker, if you will, artificially. And then ran 100,000 Monte Carlo simulations of comparing the differences between the ones that you did and the ones that you didn't. And you can't discern the difference very well. 
And in fact, like a third of the time, they got worse. So like when you took the mean across that, because you had some that were better and some that were worse, the overall mean was actually negative, if you Mm. will. Or the difference was, it's it's hard to sort of explain. Um, Yeah, no, no. So the bottom line is you can't trust it. Right. Which is really like... Is that where it's kind of coming from with like, we can't trust MTTR? Yeah. It's based on the mean, but it's... It's statistically unreliable. Too volatile or... Yeah, too too much variance. It's not random. It's not random. I mean, uh, well... High variance. High variance. Yeah. Yeah. So those outliers and some people be like, well, throw the outliers out. I'm like, but those are your incidents. You can't do that. You can't. If you take those out, you're not looking at the whole system as it really is. So I think we've long believed that we know this number and I don't even think people really know it. I don't think they're really a lot. I mean, you know, when I gave the talk, I asked how many people were, you know, are, are calculating this not a lot of hands went up. And then most of the data we have out there on what people think their MTTR is comes from, you know, survey metrics like Dora. And so these are people self-reporting what they think. So we don't really know. There's a lot of, and then there, so then there's variants of the reported data. Yeah. So when it was really interesting for me to see the actual numbers like out in the wild, and I, it was very similar to what Stephen had actually talked about earlier from Sonotype. I don't know if you talked about it on the podcast, but in his talk, he basically said, they asked people like, how confident are you that you're actually kind of catching these vulnerabilities and you're responding to them? And they were like, pretty confident. And then in the data, it was like, sad trombone noise, not act. There was a delta between what people would respond, they're saying, and they're more optimistic about how they're doing than what he actually was able to see in his own, in their own data from something like 30,000 repos. Wow. So similar effect. I don't have the really sweet position he has of having the survey data and the instrumented data from the same thing. I'm looking at Dora's and I'm, I'm making some inferences from that. And then I'm saying out in the wild, we're not really seeing that. Yeah. So if the biggest thing for me is it obfuscates the reality of, of what's actually happening with incidents. We just have this really seemingly clean, tidy number our MTTR went up and it went down. And then the question I always ask people is, well, if it went up, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Oh, well, I guess we got to go figure out why. Well, how are you going to figure out why? Well, I guess we got to go look at all those incidents. And then I ask people, well, what if it went down? Wouldn't you want to know why? Like why you're getting better or why things are getting better? I only want to research it if things are bad. Otherwise, no. I think, um, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. Like out of the door metrics, some of them are easier to track. Some of them are much harder. Yes. Some of them have, you. I think you used the word like higher fidelity. And yeah, we can even see within ARC. So at Linear B, we have these door metrics. The MTTR is one of the hardest ones to get right. Yeah. Most of the time, it's kind of around, can we really detect when we have an incident? Can well, we that's really? A, that's can a we, really great question. Can we really what is deta- an incident? Is yeah, one of my favorite questions. Okay, what? Yeah, well, <laughs> we could start there. What is an incident? But let's say that we know what it is, or we have a definition. Yeah. Do we know when it begins? Do we know when it ends? Is when, it a manual it, process? Is it an automated process? That's exactly what's in my slides. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I haven't even seen your slides. Did somebody so, update it? Did they yeah, not update it? That's the root stuff that I see within the world. Not even getting into like the results, but just yeah, track tracking. It's pretty tough and defining it and all of that. So then you think about all the time and energy and effort that you might be, people might be putting into this and it's not even telling you something useful. Like that, I would want to know if that was happening in my world. And then, so then for me, the logical, the logical sort of philosophical conclusion is, well, you don't need the number to decide to go look at your incidents to understand what's happening there. And in particular, in order to do that, you have to talk to the people who are at the sharp end of that system, right? They're the ones who know And if you do that, you not only get a lot more understanding of what's happening, but you help them hone their under their awareness of what we call like those safety boundaries. Right. Because we most of us doing what we do, especially like high performing DevOps stuff, we're operating at like the edge of the performance of those systems, whether we know it or not. And so analyzing those kinds of things helps people see those margins better, I feel like, if you will. And MTTR is a number that you give to the what we call the blunt edge, (laughs) right, of the system, but it doesn't really tell you much about what's actually happening down there. So what do you think is, I don't know, either like the next evolution or like how can people, I know for sure that people, let's say, care about MTR, MTTR because it's a concept of how long was this bad thing happening to mm-hmm. us? You don't want this, you know, our customers were impacted or whatever. Right. So we know that it's important. 
even if you took the number away from it, it's, yeah, we don't want to be down. But what is like a, I think what a lot of people are struggling with is like, what do we do? What do we do next? Yeah. I want to pause for a moment on the bad thing because the other interesting piece of metadata that we collect, at least from status pages, is a severity, right? Yeah, sure. So I, people say this to me all the time. I have this feeling and I actually had this feeling when I first started looking at the data, you know, you look at it and you're like, ooh, those ones out there are scary. They're not actually necessarily scary. They're not even necessarily bad. So we, I went and looked at, is there a correlation between duration and severity? And there's not. Statistically speaking, there's not a correlation between how long your incident is. I wouldn't think that. I think there would be. Huh. Everybody yeah. does. I yeah. did. I did. Because it's like, I don't know, just the way my brain works, common sense would... Yeah. Tell me if I thought like the severity was high, we're going to be all hand all hands on deck to fix it fast. Yeah. But you'll still yeah. have long ones you can't fix fast enough. Sure. That are bad. And then yeah. you'll have long ones where it was like, <laughs> I put this slide up in my talk and it has all these data in it. And I was like, I really want you all to see like what this variability looks like. And, and I was like, but you're not, are you? And they're all just looking at it and they're like, because I actually put the company names in on that one slide and everybody was looking at it like, is Atlassian doing better than Cloudflare? And what's happening? And because we just, we inherently think that, right? Yeah. So then I talk about the severity and there's one that's like Wistia had a really super weird Q3 number because they updated some logs or something. Yeah. But it was like a green, it was like a Sev three or four incident. Yeah. It, well, you and gotta, it wasn't that bad. Yeah. So they were like, okay, cool. It's not so bad. We'll take our time. We'll figure it out. We'll fix it. And then so I actually chart out one companies and it's the tall ones are the long ones and there's green ones and orange ones and blue ones. And then the short ones, there's all the different colors and everything in between. And statistically, that's what it bore out as well. Mm. There's not a correlation between those two attributes of incidents that we collect. Do you have a way to, or like your own standard of how to describe severities? No, no, and I do yeah. not want to get into that. No. <laughs> I don't want to, because you can't. Yeah, First hard. of all, my favorite Well, that's thing, a question do you that's have usually to? asked to me. How do we describe, I think it's because it's related to like, how do we respond? That's why. But do yeah. you need a number to know how to respond? Or can the people on the ground be like... Not a number, but I think you need something that's, or what I've seen, there's people want to know, how do I behave differently mm. in these different situations? Yeah. And how do I create these situations? What are good boys? Is it the entire service is down? Yeah. Does it have to do with, okay, if the entire service is down, but no one's actually using that service, does it matter? <laughs> if is Kubernetes like, falls over in a forest, <laughs> yeah. does anybody notice? So like a lot of the questions that come to me are kind of around that yeah. at, at first, and that's like defining it. And then I will say this much. And John Alspa has a really great post about this. Urgh, I'm forgetting the name of it, um, but I'll, I can give it to you if you want to include it after the fact. But it's it's whatever it is. It's like Goddard's law or whatever, right? Anytime yeah, yeah, yeah. a metric has a target, it gets perverted and incentivized, whatever. Yeah, and so, yeah. And so I started asking people h how their company decides severity. And there seem to be two camps. There's it's how much effort we have to throw at something. In, so internal urgency versus the impact we think it has on the customers. And they, mm -hmm. there seem to be two different sort of schools of approach to that. Yeah. But the thing I will say is no matter what you do, your people will then start gaming it. Because if you sure. make it about urgency, then, you know, you get the, we're going to make this, we're going to initially just declare it a sev one or two because we don't know. And so we want all hands on deck. Yeah. Or people do all kinds of weird things, right? Yeah. Um, to get so, the outcome that they want. Yeah. 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 So again, it's one of those things where, you know, if, if you hopefully have a generative culture, <laughs> Ron Westrom, who gave the, a talk this morning, then you might avoid that fate. But I know a couple of companies that are that have or are in the process of abandoning tracking duration and assigning official severities to things. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. You're left just discussing the details of what's happening versus... Yeah. I know, think it's like a good lead. I, what's on my mind is, okay, you know, you have this great data, we learned some stuff here, like, where is it going? Or like, what's your opinion of what to do next? Yeah, I think for people who really, so there's two, there's two things here as well. There's people who want to track MTTR because it will tell them if they're a high performer or not, according to Dora, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? But then the other piece of it is, are you more interested in actually understanding your incidents and having them and garnering more meaning from those, right? So this learning from incidents is this sort of burgeoning not even I mean it's been going around for a while but there's a bunch of us in this community and there are ways to 
study that, to study what's happening with your incidents. And there are even ways to quantify that and to put numbers behind it. Um, one of my favorite metrics around that is something called cost of coordination. This is a, a concept I at least first learned about from Dr. Laura McGuire, who's a researcher at Jelly, kind of in the same space I'm in. And she wrote her doctoral thesis on this cost of coordination in incident response, which is more like how many people were involved. Mm -hmm. People are even like how many people were paged in the middle of the night. Yeah. And yeah. across time how, of day, time of like day, all that stuff effort, yeah, across how many unique teams in across how, how many tools did they have to use to triage the incident? How many Slack channels were involved? Were there concurrent incidents being fought at the same time? And were there people were yeah. working across those? Did PR and comms get involved? That's cool. It's like an internal impact. How did it like impact the people having to resolve it? Yeah, because that's, that's ultimately like that. how if we're talking about how resilient you are, those people are your sources of resilience, right? They are what give you the adaptive capacity in these kinds of complex systems. And yeah. they, they have this long earned knowledge, right, about those systems. And so I, tracking what they're doing and how they're impacted, I think, tells you a lot about the resilience of your system. The other thing that people are tracking, starting to track, David Lay gave a really great talk about this at IBM, which is like 12,000 person organization out of the CIO office. And they're even tracking, they have a monthly CIO learning from incidents where they go through a bunch of their incidents. They're tracking how many people are coming to those meetings, how many people are coming to more than one meeting, how many people are reading the reports, how many times the reports are being cited in reference to other reports. You can even look at whether they're being referenced in like code commits or, or those kinds of things. So that's one other thing that people can actually look into and put a number on to say, like, are we getting better or worse at some of this? Or at least what's the impact on the teams that are managing these systems? And how are those systems responding? And the other one I ask people to look at is near misses, which I think is a really, really fascinating number. It's also, though, probably as hard to collect. As yeah. to, first of all, there's what's a near miss versus what's an incident. I usually tell people to follow if there's smoke, it's probably a near incident. Uh, or a near miss because it's, it's everyone running somebody, some engineer looks at a dashboard and goes, that's weird. Right. And then everyone runs around with their hair on fire for a while, but they figure it out and they fix it before it hits yeah. the outside so world. That, yeah, that that type of work's probably like not it's, quantified, but it's, like it but you, it could be. Yeah, it could. And it's not visible. Yeah, and yeah. I guarantee you that there are significantly more of those than there are of the other. And Definitely. so there I don't know what that means yet. Yeah. I don't know. And we no, don't have the data on percentage of People yeah. rarely report near misses publicly. Yeah. Honeycomb's the only company I've ever seen that really does it. But it was true. Honeycomb's doing it. A little bit. I've seen yeah. a few. Fred, yeah, Fred has written a couple of those up. Okay. And uh, and Reddit, yeah, Reddit actually considered a couple of their, so during all the GameStop yeah. bananas-ness, <laughs> and this is on, the, I had them as a guest on the Void podcast. They actually, because that was a heck of a week for them. And the team that was fighting all of that, they still out of all of that were managed to pull out a couple of things that they considered near misses that were also successes. So they were architectural things that they chose to invest in at some point pre GameStop, Hubaloo, and it, the decisions they made actually paid off in that situation where something did scale the way it was yeah. supposed to scale. And, and they called that a near miss, but they also then were able to tie that back as a pointing to like near misses are that, you know, the spooky places, but they're also ammunition for all of those, those areas that engineers want to fix, but yeah. never can get like budget or people for. Yeah. You can come with data like, Hey, we're on the brink of a bad situation. And here's what's happened. And it's happened this many times. That's cool. It's super cool. Yeah. So I wish that was tracked more. Yeah. I really think people should nice. study that. And then, and it's also like successes. It's where your team, it's how they use their expertise and their knowledge to keep that system running. Very cool stuff. What else do we need to know <laughs> about incidents? Is there any other topic? My other favorite yeah. spicy take is the mental model that people use when they're trying to solve an incident. So for a long time, we hear the words root cause a lot. And this also like MTTR did not originate in the tech industry. Um, it came from other places and we've co-opted that much to my chagrin. I started tracking this last year, like how many companies or how many incidents in, in the void are claiming to use either like formal root cause analysis, so RCA, or at least say we found the root cause. And my favorite ones are where they say we found the root cause and it was this seven sequence of things, you're like, that's not a root cause. That's like seven contributing factors yeah, that all had to happen 
in a special, unique way for this thing to happen. And I have a whole bunch of writing in one of the reports about why. We probably don't have a ton of time to get into that right now. But I think MTR saying that like we found the root cause tends to it's sort of the root cause is where you stop looking any further, right? And it tends to narrow people's focus. And it also it models a way of thinking about your systems that there is a, that there is one thing that can contribute to that, right? Some people talk more about triggers and what have you, but I don't, I think it's a mental model that's not helpful. And so when I first was looking at that, we had about 26% of the reports in the void had some connection to root cause analysis, but we only had about 1800 reports at the time. And it was really two companies that were sort of driving that percentage. It was Microsoft and it was Google. And so the numbers dropped way down this year, just because we added like seven, 8,000 incidents, right? So we just, you know, what's the word for when you add more liquid to something? And then anyways, I was it's diluted. Yeah, right? we diluted yeah. that number. <laughs> Thank you. I was once a chemistry <laughs> major. So that the drop from 26 to 6% is artificial of just adding yeah. stuff in. But a funny thing happened on the way to the theater of all of that, which is in June of this year, Microsoft stopped doing declaring formal root cause analysis on their incidents. Yeah. And they started doing what they call a post incident review. And they started inc including a huge amount of detail of what was happening, in, you know, in sort of this very learning from incidents way of looking at that. And I thought that was a big milestone for a company the size of Microsoft that had taken that approach and that philosophy towards their incidents to, to make a pretty big shift. Yeah. And so that's something I was looking for and looking to track just because I think... That's a cool mental model change. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And it was all part of a group effort from a number of people there. But it was cool for Microsoft to go like, yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. That makes sense. Like the language of how we do this matters. Yeah. And it changes our focus and our approach. And so we're going to we're going to do that. And we're going to go dig into these things and be very much more transparent, you know, publicly about what those are. Yeah, I that, wish more people that, would do that. That is a big step. Usually when I hear about the RCA, like root cause analysis, it's because or what I've found is, okay, let's say like maybe you have an incident and it affects a customer and that customer pays you a lot of money. They want to feel secure that it's one thing and you know yes. how to fix it. Yep. <laughs> that's what the, whether it's right or wrong, that's what the RCA does. It's, yeah. Even if it's a false confidence, it's, hey, yeah, we know exactly what happened and here's how it's, we're going to fix it. It won't happen again. It won't Done. happen again. But my favorite. all this language of triggers and this and that sounds... That doesn't sound like you it sounds scarier. Yeah, it sounds scarier. And it's and I it's interesting though, because and the difference between say customers and and like engineers is an interesting one there because the companies who have customers that are engineers are more the ones who are doing this. Yeah, so your honeycomb, like, your Azure. It. Yeah, they you get know, it. not only do they get it, but it actually builds more trust. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because okay, if you get it, yeah, then you can be more open and more open builds more trust. Yeah. But if you don't, I mean, because anyone in, with those companies is like, yeah, I'm an engineer too. This happens to us. Yeah. But if you don't understand that, you just want it simplified. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the next thing that I'd like to, I mean, I, I talk a lot in the 2021 report and I'll talk more about it in the next one as well is, is how important language is in these situations. Yeah. And, you know, we have, the, I should mention that the things that we have in the void aren't all just status pages and blog posts and postmortems written by companies. We also include social media posts. And there's a lot of news sources in there, too. I would say until we added this, this whole new batch this fall, that it was almost 50-50, what we call like primary and secondary sources. And so primary is written by the organization. Secondary is anything written about that. And the kind, the tone, the language, the it's, I can, I know, because I've read lots of them, but I'd actually like to do a bit more sort of formal language analysis on that is the media wants the root cause. And, and there's a lot of blame too, that gets thrown around on the media side of the house, you know, and like these, these, you know, modern IT companies don't even know what they're doing. And so that's where I tell companies that the language matters, because we're shaping what the public sees in how we write about these things. And I would love to see the media eventually start to develop some sophistication about how they write about these things yeah. and, and talk about them. Probably will take some time, but I think I actually think it can happen. I might be yeah. retired by then. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. All right. This has been super informative. Tell me about you, so you have your own pod, The Void. I, yeah. I do. I did mention that. Yeah. I will gladly plug my yeah. podcast on your podcast. So it's just the Void podcast. It's I should probably work on that. I think we just got a new head of marketing. I'm sure she can help me. I'm good at naming things, but sometimes it's hard to get like the right URL. Okay. The premise of the Void podcast is 
practitioners, not armchair quarterbacks, especially like in the security world, right? There's like a million podcasts of two dudes sitting, and I'm sorry, it's usually two dudes sitting around talking about how stupid everybody was with that one, you know, getting pwned with that, you know, vulnerability. And I'm just like, this is when I bang the microphone. <laughs> and, and they don't know anything about what happened. They think they know a lot, but no, right? You, you know as much as the rest of us do. Yeah. And so there's a million, a million of those. There's actually a couple really good ones in the learning from incidents and availability space that I think folks get that right. But what I really wanted to do was tell true stories, let people tell their true stories. And because the other thing that's like wild about these incidents, if you've been involved with them or you study them or you analyze them and you read really detailed ones is like, these are stressful, like most of the time, stressful, whether they end up being bad or not, right? Stressful, often very like emotional events. And we don't, when we, when everything's written up too, like you get the root cause thing and it's, we found the problem and everything's locked up and tally ho Jim and off we go. And like, <laughs> there's like a wake of people, uh, you know, that are like exhausted and worried <laughs> that it's, you know, what's next. So I wanted people to be able to talk about the, that more human side of these things, yeah. but then also to talk about what they learn from being involved in it and from writing it up. So we take an incident that has a write up in the void and we bring that one to the table and then we talk about that. And the stuff that comes out of these, like people talking about these things is just, yeah, it's amazing. So we've had, a, super you know, cool. the Reddit like one it. was really cool. The next one that's about to come out is going to be Spotify. So I've got a podcast talking about a podcasting company. I think I could get more meta about that. I'm not sure. Um, so it's hard. I don't have a lot of, of episodes because usually there's lawyers involved, <laughs> which just, yeah. yay, no offense to lawyers. So I'm, people have had have been involved in incidents and I please if you've written them up because really that is the premise of the show that other people can read about it then I would I'm always open to have people come on and tell true tales that is super super cool if you do have a tale to tell check out the void pod we can include all your yeah, information I'll give you, yeah uh, it's, you, it's, you, you had to get a really weird yeah. community yeah. url yeah. because the internet's annoying. But uh, yeah, I think that will help everybody and help everyone's learning. Yeah, and the goal is the whole goal of this, which I didn't, my PR guy is going to probably smack me around after this. But like the, the reason I started this thing was because the internet runs our world and we want it to be more reliable, more resilient. We want it to be a safe place. So I want it to be better personally than I like. It's not what I was promised. <laughs> right? And I'm like, I'm not going to solve all of those problems. But that's partly also why this isn't some proprietary thing that we're going to charge Gartner prices for. Yeah, it's yeah. open. People can come and poke around. If people yeah, want to Everyone's come and... involved. Everyone's affected by this stuff. So. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions and myths. And if we can bust some of those with data and then also show how good these people are what they do. I'm, I'll be pretty happy if we succeed in that. Well, we are a supporter of The Void. Definitely we'll check out the pod. And Courtney, thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me on. It was really cool. Everyone, if you could go on to Apple Pods, could really use your review. It totally helps us get out there. We have to spread the DI love, get the learnings. So if you could go on to Apple Pods and review, give a positive review for Dev Interrupted, will totally help us out. Thank you so much.